Hey, everybody. I'm Josh. Uh, I work here at Aspen. I'm the director of AI and Democracy, and I've been doing some work uh, on the topic that we're going to discuss today. But before I kick it over to one-off introductions, we're really excited to have Miranda here, who's the founding director over at CDT of the AI Governance Lab, I think is what we're mm -hmm. calling it. Uh, Sam is the executive director over at Witness and has been leading a lot of work catches TED Talk, multiple TED Talks at this point? I don't know, catches TED Talk. Um, at the intersection of information, factuality, public trust, democracy, and human rights, really. Uh, and then Eli is a political consultant, does a lot of work, uh, has done a lot of work for a number of years in the kind of reproductive rights advocacy space, but has worked at a lot of uh, national and statewide campaigns. So I'll kick it to you for kind of first introductions uh, for everybody, and then we'll get into the substance. Miranda. Great. Thanks, Josh. So nice to be here. Um, I'm back. Uh, I was here last year um, under the auspices of my role at Meta, where I worked um, on the policy team with the responsible AI and equity teams. And so it's nice to be back in a different context. Um, my work is really about translating what the policy conversation is around AI to practitioners, because we know that that gap can be vast, um, and that the implementation of some of the you know policy ideas um, can really make or break whether those ideas are, are effective. And obviously, particularly at this moment in this year, there's so many elections. Um, AI is, is you know shape shifting every day. Um, that's a, a huge part of my role too. Although CDT has teams focused on elections specifically, so I'll be bringing in some of their expertise. Do you want me to talk about any substantive stuff or just intros? Just intros at this point. We'll get <laughs> Pass it on. Hi, everyone. Really glad to be here. So Sam from Witness. We're a human rights organization. We work globally with frontline communities of activism and journalism who are using uh, the digital tools of video, social media, the mobile web um, for their work. Um, so we're very focused on how they are optimized to make sure they work for those purposes in a way that um, is equitable in, in access, in usage, and in security. Um, for the past five or six years, we've worked on a range of emerging technologies that we see impacting the capacity of people to be equal participants in sharing information and being trusted. Um, and so that's led us to work on deep fakes and synthetic media and AI. And of course, all of that, all of those chickens are coming home to roost at the moment. <laughs> um, and so how do we respond to that is very much where we're focused at the moment awesome. from a mode of prepare, don't panic. I'm Eli. I'm really happy to be here, thank you. Um, I come at this from elections. Um, I've been working in elections and sort of in the guts of elections for a number of years. Um, I mostly work in a, a pretty interesting uh, little corner of elections, which is independent expenditure campaigns. Um, if you're not familiar, which is where an entity that is not the candidate themselves puts on a fully parallel campaign to get a candidate elected. Um, I've done that for Planned Parenthood for a number of years. I've done that for democracy reform organizations for a number of years. And I've also been a campaign manager for candidates. Um, guess which one is better? Not working with candidates. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, uh, the, the difference between us is that my background in the way that AI works in civic spaces and in election spaces is that it is, it is principally about what gives us agita and what we are reactive to um, and what damages our efforts. Um, uh, and I think the election space is just starting to move into a frame of how can this help us instead of how can we counter bad actors. Um, so I'm excited to talk about all that. Really excited to get into kind of the, the the topic writ large, but before we do on the AI side specifically, I'm curious to kind of ground the conversation, framing out elections as a forcing function, as a ground zero for different types of technologies and what we may have learned or not learned uh, over the years. And so actually, Eli, we'll start with you. Um, curious what your thoughts are. It can go back as far as you would like. It could be a decade, it can be 100 years. Mm -hmm but intersection of new tech, new social adaptation, and elections specifically. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> he's queuing me up because I told him something before this. Um, we made it happen. Yeah. Made it. Um, so a uh, fun fact that is not well known is that campaigning for elected office originated in the United States. Um, uh, and it originated just shortly after the revolution. It used to be considered unseemly to campaign. Um, people who were candidates for high office, whether it was governor or president, um, it was considered ungentlemanly of them to go around asking people to vote for them. Um, and that all changed in the late 1700s and early 1800s when 
Jefferson and Burr and Hamilton all started printing things that they would post around cities, and that they would print in um, urban circulating newspapers to advocate for themselves and their candidacies. And it was considered shameful. It was considered grotesque. But among the many things that's interesting about it is one of the things that was considered wrong was that it targeted urban dwellers. They were posting their materials in urban spaces. They were putting their advertisements in urban newspapers. And there was a major concern that it was leaving out like the gentleman farmer variety, right? Obviously, there are tons of people who don't live in urban spaces who are not gentlemen farmers even then. But in their frame, they're talking about people who at that time had the right to vote. Um, and it was considered a real problem that was driving a wedge into the already sort of fractious young republic um, because there was already that tension between are we an agrarian economy or will we become an urban industrial economy? Um, and uh, while they were fighting about whether that was a good or bad thing, it ended up not mattering because it just took off, right? That's how we did elections from then on in this country. So one of the really interesting early lessons in our electoral history is that tech innovations, morally neutral, good, bad, or ugly, you introduce them to an election, they're staying in an election. And so the question is, how do we move forward with them? Go down the row here. Um, so I, I think when I think about tech as a forcing function, I think about some scenarios where I've seen it very proactively in the context we work in. And Witness works globally, including in the US. Um, on um, and, and I'm going to particularly look at it through the lens of social media. So, you know, very proactive things like putting together war rooms, not a great phrase, but election war rooms to prepare, resourcing journalists, resourcing fact checkers. Those are all proactive, but they're frankly at the margins of the problem. There are reactive solutions, and um, a lot of my work is, and I'm not supposed to say this on a panel on elections, is decentering elections and looking at what's not happening during the elections. So I think about, obviously, you know, responses to things like the Myanmar genocide and trying to think about how we improve AI-based classifiers, but also really think about how content moderation works very broadly. Uh, maybe more positively, we might look at something like WhatsApp messaging and limiting forwards, right? The kind of reacting to something where you are seeing pervasive spread of misinformation. So following a problem, let's try and come up with a solution. Um, and I wanna put the layer that we also encounter and I think we'll encounter around AI and we are seeing, for example, in the Indian elections of coercive action by governments um, using elections as a forcing function on companies and on civil societies. We've got proactive, reactive, and coercive. And I guess what we wanna put out in a vision is much more how do we have more of the proactivity in a more inclusive way that is also more structural. And I think that's when I look at kind of my experience of looking at tech, particularly around social media, which is what we've got to learn from what we didn't do well as we move into the AI era is how do we move away from the parts of that were reactive, too late, or temporary, and not structural. From you know my perspective, I think elections, especially in the US, although certainly not exclusively, are a quintessential equity issue because it's very much about who um, is given the agency to have their voices heard and what are the structural issues that prevent people from fully participating in, in, uh, in the institutions uh, that will enable them to do so. And there's, a, there's so many lessons to learn about the ways in which um, we have you know, made progress and, and regressed in equitable participation in political processes over you know, the, the centuries here that I think um, from a product and technology perspective we can learn from. How do we know if there are disparities? What are the structural issues that we might not realize or some people, some people might not realize are preventing people from participating and other people were very conscious about those choices that they made. Um, you know, lots of parallel lessons to learn. And then on the flip side, technology, you know, information technology has always played the shifting role uh, in um, enabling people who are not in positions of power to have their voices heard, but then being co-opted by the, the forces in power to um, continue the status quo or shut down those voices. And each new iteration of technology kind of goes through that cycle. And you know, political campaigns in particular have tended to be on the forefront of some of the newer technologies, especially recently, the Obama campaign, you know, the, the um, what was his name, got on the table, Howard. <laughs> uh, and, and now AI, you know, these tools uh, enable campaigns to scale their messages, to personalize their messages um, in ways that they, they see being useful and for for candidates who um, wouldn't otherwise have the resources to participate that could be really great and for for candidates who um, you know 
have designs on what electorate they want to, to come out and vote for them with a grander design toward what policies they ultimately want, like that could end up being a tool to perpetuate the inequities that society uh, experiences right now. So I think that you know, both that, that legacy of elections as an equity issue and the role that technology plays in shifting power are, are just a great instigator for the conversation. Randall, we'll stick with you then for a minute. I mean, our background, we, we both were in tech policy before and within the companies themselves. And I'm curious how you see the forcing function aspect of elections internally as shaping the priority structure, the challenges that society uh, surfaces and doesn't surface uh, around kind of seminal election events. How do you think that tech policy people should be appropriating that, thinking about that as we head into November in the United States? So as I'm sure everyone in this room uh, feels viscerally, there are, is a lot to do within these companies and the name of the game is prioritization and there's always questions around what's going to end up being prioritized, what resources will be allocated to what. And unfortunately, timeliness and public attention is one of the factors that leads to those prioritization decisions. Within that, you know, tech companies, and this is some research I did back when I was uh, um, in an academic context, um, there's a spectrum of the motivations they have to make policy decisions, to make prioritization decisions, product decisions, et cetera, from like intrinsically understanding the role they're playing in society, and especially the social platforms uh, in their early days were trying to take on this grander um, role in society and mediating kind of information and appreciated, you know, that the extent to which that that was the case. Um, in other cases, they just understand that in order to have legitimacy with the broader market, with their users, with the, the public and with um, policymakers, they need to, um, you know, be sensitive to that role and, and kind of uh, make reasonable efforts to make sure they're not disrupting something. And in other cases, it's more about like crisis management um, and, and fear that, you know, something acutely wrong is happening and they're going to be to blame. Um, so, you know, that, uh, we see sort of different flavors of that across different companies um, and across different levels of maturity of companies. So um, companies that have been around longer have sort of public stakeholders like look different. Um, but, you know, regardless of the motivation there, I think uh, these big public moments do drive attention and um, resources get, get paid to them. I think we're seeing less resources on elections this year, unfortunately, even though it's the biggest year for elections in you know, some time and for some time uh, in the future, and it could be a pivotal year. And so um, the question is, you know, how can we leverage that attention to focus not only, like, what is the infrastructure we can build with that attention that's not unique to elections, but that will help in that, you know, everything that's not elections that still are really important, and also how do we make sure that we're not just focusing on the most prominent national elections in the biggest markets, because the, the real change will come in the long tail of everyone else who isn't being paid attention to. You know, if there's uh, syn synthetic media about them, no, will no, no one will notice. It's in different languages, it will go unaddressed, but it could still have a, you know, an enormous influence on society, on local policy, um, which can bubble up into national policy. And so if we only pay attention to the top of the iceberg, um, we're gonna miss out on a whole lot of really important impacts. So, you know, I think we take the attention on the top to, to build out something that will help with that whole ecosystem. I'm gonna throw an AI layer onto all of it, but before we do anything more, uh, either Sam or Eli, on the kind of forcing function, the way that we should think about elections and channeling that for positive change on the equity front this cycle. No, nothing more from me. No. Um, <clears throat> you know, the only thing I would add to this is that coming off of what Miranda's saying, um, as, as, as with that, with elections, the top is always what people are paying attention to um, <laughs> for plenty of fine reasons. Um, uh, but it is, in fact, the further down you go on the ballot, the more you are talking about the people who create the laws that impact your life on a daily basis, right? Like something like 80% of the laws that people interact with on a daily basis are created by state or local legislatures, not the federal government. Um, and that's to say nothing of, of course, in a moment like this, the role that state legislatures are playing as backstops against a lot of work. Um, and that that those tech innovations and the way that they can funnel down to campaigns in really positive, generative ways do not make it to local races. They are expensive. The consultants who teach you how to use them are expensive. And local races, as much time as we spend thinking about how much money is spent on top of ticket races, local races are cheap, which can be great if you are a good actor and want to get involved. Um, but they are absent of the resources to maximize the, the tech innovations that we have. If you are trying to 
as one should at this time, flip the Arizona state legislature, um, there is no chance, there is no possibility that the people who are running those campaigns have access to the tech that could make those campaign plans more efficient, that could make their voter targeting more equitable and just based on their value systems. There's, they have no access to it. And so one of the things that would be a great step forward in the civic tech partnership space is figuring out how to marry those top of ticket advances with those bottom of ticket opportunities. That's a great point. So it's been, what, 18 months or so since OpenAI rolled out ChatGPT and we all started talking about generative AI and there was this kind of new set of questions, some of which were just reframings of old questions that we've had around information integrity, who's left out of conversations uh, in different information silos, news deserts, things like that, and how that might be exacerbated. I'm curious, uh, we'll start with you, Sam. What should we be watching? Uh, there have been a number of elections to date. The interaction and use of AI, or the lack thereof, what should we be noticing right now that should inform our perspective going forward? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're four months into this sort of omnibus election year, and 18 months into sort of the generative AI being broadly available, broadly commoditized, and getting increasingly easy to use. And I think we are all aware of those technical trends that underlie this, so less data required to create something, much more access to it, and very significant improvements in image and audio, right? And so the way we're seeing that play out, and I think it's really helpful as we sit here in the US at the moment and think about the US elections, also to look at the comparatives. So if we look at what happened in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, what's happening now in India, you actually see far more widespread use of, for example, deep fakes and synthetic media than here, right? And so uh, there are potentially some reasons why that is the case and why it might not be the case here, but I don't think we should make too many assumptions. So if we look, let's let's take some of the ways we're seeing it play out at the moment in, in global context. There is extensive use of AI to create personalized messaging from candidates, you know, over 50 million messages sent in India where candidates have created avatars where they speak directly to people, use their name, um, have lip sync dubbing that matches it. That is a widespread industry that is kicking off with very little regulation and very little control. It's not personalized the individual. I think that's a fear mongering of like, we get these massively personalized, like interactive AI that is not happening but it is you know sort of distributed messaging happening a lot of campaigning that's about humanizing candidates in ways that sort of nudge the edges right like making cuddly avatars of indonesian presidents making your your prime minister sing and making that participatory kind of what someone called soft fakes room and chowdery um and and then of course people using it to attack and deceive and right and i think it's really important i Josh, you were mentioning like this is grounded in existing dynamics. One of the existing dynamics this is grounded in is gender-based violence and uh, uh, non-consensual sexual images, right? And we're definitely seeing that. It's also nuanced, right? So for example, in Bangladesh, candidates were being placed in swimwear, right? Um, rather than being nudified, right? Which is obviously you know a very pervasive and challenging phenomenon, but we're seeing that expanding. It obviously targets public and private figures. And then, you know, much more deceptive ones in a very explicit election context, right? So it's been a characteristic of like the elections to date this year of having candidates in the last few days appear to say they're boycotting an election or asking you to vote for the other candidate or withdrawing. It happened in Taiwan, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, right? So very characteristic. Um, and of course, these audio deep fakes that we've experienced in a very minor way in the US, honestly, with the Biden robocall in some sense, compared to some of the ways we're seeing it. And so you've got this wide range of actions and it's not quite the house is on fire, honestly, from my perspective, but it is very significant as a trend line. And the thing, and I hope we'll come back to this, of course, most of the countermeasures, either at a product or a policy level, are either not there or are inadequate to serve both global populations and a broad diversity of the US population who is going to engage in elections this year. Is it fair to say that abroad we're seeing these tech tools used to try to motivate behavior rather than to demobilize at this point, or are we not sure yet? I, I think we're not sure. Um, I think there are very explicit attempts to, to get people not to vote, which also include influence operations, right? There's clearly evidence of sort of influence operations using often quite blunt AI imagery in Taiwan and in the US context. 
Um, so I, I think it's a mix of stuff. And I think, you know, we've got questions we look ahead about what it means to have a volume of this content, a personalization that we haven't yet grappled with that I think raise really troubling questions about demotivating voters. The other thing that we see, in, and I think this ties into the lack of solutions, is around the absence of ways to detect and understand this content that allows sort of plausible deniability. So it's a real challenge that people dismiss real compromising content, as they have before, right? This is not novel, um, as being faked and sort of place the burden of proof on, on publics to, to disprove that. That's a really great point. Miranda, it, same kind of question. What should we be noticing, uh, especially as we approach November in the United States? Well, I think, you know, as companies are building more general purpose tools, and not just general purpose platforms, which have large impacts, but these tools that can do so many different things and require a much more defensive approach to preventing all the bad things they can do, I think we'll see, you know, unexpected ways. You know, people are talking about um, synthetic media, they're talking about targeting, they're talking about... Um, they're talking about uh, uh, voter suppression, things like that. But there are probably going to be all sorts of things that people didn't anticipate. And the trick with this, and thinking about a general purpose technology and making prioritization decisions around what you're going to address, is that question of like, what can we imagine could go wrong and can we build something to detect it and prevent it? And usually the first stop of any you know, multinational company is like English, maybe Spanish, maybe another language. Um, because that's the, the most prominent and noticeable sort of set of issues, and that just leaves so much on the table. So even if, we can, if we notice something in the US or English context at all, um, we, can't, we don't know that we will, we certainly will not uh, in other languages if we're not thinking about that holistically from the beginning, but do the teams have folks who can imagine what that looks like in a, you know, an international context? Can they imagine what it looks like to disenfranchise um, uh, disabled voters, for instance. I was part of a, a planning group for this uh, election red teaming event where we tested a bunch of the different um, interactive sort of LLM uh, tools on reasonable queries that users might make about voting. And in about 70% of cases, I think it was, the answers were inaccurate, but not in ways that were obvious. They were mostly accurate, except for the piece that was, um, like, determined the meaning of the outcome. But you wouldn't know unless, and we had at the tables in this red teaming exercise, election officials from the jurisdictions about which the questions were being asked. And only by having them sitting at the table, they could be like, that sounds reasonable, but that, that's actually wrong. It's outdated, or there's a court case, um, or you could imagine how someone would think that, but, like, that's not the advice we give to the, uh, the poll workers. And so figuring out what the... Uh, threat scenarios are is is different than in other products where it's just like is it failing you know or are people um, you know falling off or are, you know are they being denied opportunities or something which is still hard to detect we don't have the best ways to do that but um, it's at least a little bit more tangible and in these cases the the issues are more subtle and more cumulative and you know I, I think we'll get pretty far along before we quite realize the issues that are coming up. So that's the biggest thing I worry about, is that there's a lot of attention to the like biggest and loudest and most obvious issues and still not solutions to them. But there's a lot more that's going to be coming up that we'll need to be ready to tackle once th it sort of takes form. Eli? Um, a prediction that I hope is wrong, but I think is right, um, is that I would wager in the American 2024 context, and I'm sure 26 and on, um, most of the advances, the meaningful tech advances, uh, particularly in AI, will probably use, be used for suppressive efforts, not for motivating efforts. Um, we've seen it already uh, in, in plenty of ways. And unfortunately, the thing that's true is that tech advancements that begin as motivational are always eventually co-opted and turned into something suppressive, right? So there's a direct line between from Howard Dean to the Obama data boys to Cambridge Analytica, right? It's just like one, two, three. Um, so I think that from the civic space and the election space, the thing to do is to not try and turn ourselves into tech experts and to build as strong a relationship as we can with folks in the tech sector, because if we can walk in assuming that the efforts will be suppressive in nature, um, then we can do the background work because we know who people try to suppress. That's no mystery in this country, right? We know who we're suppressing when we're suppressing voters. Um, and instead engage in the really, and you know, on the one hand, we're late at it, and on the other hand, 
never too never too late to start. Um, the work of understanding the um, the things that go into making suppression so easy for some communities, um, particularly, and I think this is where the AI aspect interacts in the, in the scariest way for me as a as an election practitioner, um, the lack of trust in the system. Um, in in communities that are traditionally disenfranchised is growing, right? There's good research on this. Um, when you look at a community that has measures of disenfranchisement and you can even give them like disenfranchisement quotients, right? As the disenfranchisement quotient goes up, the trust in the system and the faith in the electoral process goes down. Um, and something that election folks haven't quite figured out yet um, is that, you know, the, the adage that if you're black in America, you gotta work twice as hard to get half as far. We need to take that on in, in the reverse, in the positive obligation sense, and think of it as if you are trying to motivate disenfranchised voters, then you need to work twice as hard to get half as far in upping their faith in the process and the system. Um, and that means that you need to go in really early with an understanding of the ways they've been targeted in the past. That is where great tech partnerships could be super productive um, and work in tech and non-tech ways at addressing those reasons, which are almost always very valid, that people lack faith in the process and the system. Eli, let me tie that to the technology. So LLMs, one of the key advances is in the text side of things, not necessarily multimedia and in the language capacity, right? Communicating effectively, compellingly, with the right idiomatic expressions in a language that you have no expertise in. It was really hard for bad guys before, very, very easy now. So you could see something like a major WhatsApp campaign targeting uh, Arabic speakers in Dearborn saying to boycott the election and is that the type of thing that you're talking about, grounded in the tech? Partially, it? yes. So, uh, and indeed, we have seen that, right? Um, uh, we have seen mass WhatsApp chains deployed in Georgia um, in 2018 and in 2020 to try and demotivate and suppress voters in Asian American communities um, that were in language and that had everything like the aura of authenticity. They looked like sort of grassroots-based mass mobilization efforts that were in fact demobilization efforts. Um, and then the other the other problem is, and it's I'm not a tech person, so I'm going to go high level on this. The the it is impossible to overstate how scared of deep fakes people in the election space are, um, because they have the ability to confirm everyone's worst fears, and democracy functions best when we are not running on our worst fears. Democracy functions best when we are working on our highest hopes. Um, but if you create a system where everyone might see the candidate they are mm, on the fence about, and that person is saying exactly the thing that they fear that person really believes and really will implement, you're not gonna get them to vote for the other guy, you're just gonna get them to stay home, right? Um, so that's really the fear that there is, there, is such a, there is such a narrow tipping point for an impactful enough portion of the electorate, or I wanna point out this part's really important, the potential electorate, because we have criminally low participation rates in this country. Um, it's just, there are so many good reasons for the, the lack of trust and faith in the system that any, any deep fake can just tip a whole community over into not participating. Um, and it's, it is the talk of the town. If you sit down with people who are working on elections right now and you ask them what keeps them up at night, nine out of 10 answers, deep fakes. Just terrifies people. Sam, there's the sociological aspect of this, some of what Eli was getting at. Um, and then there's the technological side. One thing, you know, back when I was at Meta, say in the lead up to 2020, the public expectation and conversation that was being had was what are you all going to do in the information integrity space? But because all the focus has been on AI tools, the question is now what are you going to do to technically detect and therefore label this type of content, which are fundamentally different things. And you have been doing some interesting work around the concerns on the erosion of trust, the liar's dividend. Could you fill out a little bit of the sociological side for the folks here? Yeah, and, and I think, Eli, what you're describing there is, I, you know, I mentioned the idea of plausible deniability, which is the idea that, you know, because of photorealism, audio realism, it's very easy to claim that something is uh, real when it's falsified. Um, and this plays into a technical gap that is worth really thinking through because it's filled with concerns around equity and access. 
But I also think there's plausible believability, which is the actually probably what we see more commonly, and it's a trope of what we already have in mis- and disinformation is people lean into what they want to believe about an individual or within their political viewpoint, and we're seeing that with deep fakes. So I think we need to think about both sides of this sort of plausible believability, plausible deniability, and it is linked to technical questions, right? Because uh, one of the things, and you know, witness works in multiple levels. We do policy work, we do work with companies on the technical elements and product elements, but we also run a rapid response mechanism around people who have cases of suspected deepfakes that applies globally, so journalists and fact checkers bring it. And the reason we run that is that for most frontline election officials, journalists, fact checkers, there are not reliable tools to be able to detect deepfakes, to be able to explain it to their publics in a climate where people are skeptical about scientific communication, where journalists and, and others are not well equipped to do this. And there's a range of reasons why detection tools don't work well. This is not to, to cast shade on uh, people working in this space. It is hard to build reliable detection tools. But it's also hard to build reliable detection tools that are easily explainable to the public. And we're not investing in the data sets and the tools that are built for the, for the world and for the US rather than English-speaking um, white individuals. Let's look at audio and, um, and video and image detection, right? So there is a technical gap. There's also a emission, a very obvious emission in terms of detection. And what that means is it's very easy to cast doubt on content. Um, and we haven't invested in making sure that those who are most vulnerable and the communities who are most targeted by this have the most access. We've flipped it the other way around. Right, so the communities that have the most access to detection are the ones who have the most resources and perhaps are the most well protected to begin with. And then of course we have the authenticity side you were saying, right, which is you know, how do we know where a piece of media came from? And, and all the same questions apply there, right? This is the big sort of thing that everyone is latching onto from a legislative side and from a technical side is let's show people the recipe of how AI was used to make a piece of content you're experiencing. But that the, the decision making around that is laden with questions around privacy, around access to tools, around how you build those in a way that doesn't reinforce bias or existing problems. And, and I think that's why this room needs to really invest in that space now, because the tools are not going to be here for this election. They're not going to be widely used, but they will be here in 2025, 2026. And we are setting the foundations for how we understand trust and who gets trusted in our societies. And that's not just about deep fakes. It's about all content. Um, and I think that's the key right now, is to sort of think from that perspective. Even with the right forensic tools, it's always going to be a confidence interval, right? We are 70% sure that this is synthetic, et cetera. So it's always going to have an element of trust. Yeah, we're, probably, yeah, we're only ever going to get to 85 to 90 with detection tools. So you've got to work out how do you explain 85 to 90 when people rightly are skeptical of the tools because they're not great for many communities and they're not accessible and they haven't been made accessible for those communities. That's a great point. Miranda, like, I'm curious how you're thinking about the risk that people throw up their hands and say, we're going to vote based on vibes, gut instinct, <laughs> because we don't, we don't have facts. We don't know what's factual. How are you seeing that kind of risk set? Well, I think the risk of vibes is actually more pervasive than just in the elections. And I think it's coming up in all sorts of generative, gener generative AI contexts, you know, relying on reinforcement learning from human feedback, relying on, um, you know, sort of these uh, alignment procedures, which are like basically content moderation, but less structured and less inclusive. Um, and we've forgotten the lessons that we've learned from making sure that those definitions about meaningful concepts that affect people's lives, that, that will be used used to determine what information they can get out of a system or share on the internet um, doesn't fall into the traps we've found before. I think we're forgetting all those lessons, and so, um, but we're kind of throwing reinforcement learning from human feedback at it and calling it okay. And it's like basically, a, you know, an advisor uh, of my my team, um, his uh, Dave Wilner, if anyone's familiar, um, he he calls it vibes-based content moderation. <laughs> and and so I think that the rush to build out these exciting new tools um, is leading to shortcuts of all kinds, and that is going to lead to, uh, you know, reduced trust in, in all contexts, you know, whether it's elections or otherwise. But there's also some, you know, more basic, uh, you know, and, and 
infrastructural questions that lead to that reduction of trust that don't have anything to do with AI. Um, you know, my organization a year or two ago did a report on websites of election officials across the country and found that I think it was less than half of them use .gov domain names. And so there's some pretty basic interventions that, that you know could um, create indications of a little bit more trust that maybe would say, yeah, this is like a real thing and they're the ones who I should get information from and not this other website who's saying I vote on the day after the election. Um, and so in the equity context, I think that that's an approach that I always uh, found to be useful to take because let's, you know, there's one approach um, in thinking about equity and access to elections, which is like the get out the vote to specific communities and, you know, meeting people where they are. And, and that's really important. Um, but sometimes, you know, if it's if it's more expensive, if it's controversial, if people then presume, you know, have a political motivation for something that can create barriers to actually accomplishing uh, that work, especially, you know, from a platform perspective and not from like a particular political persuasion perspective where that's expected. Um, but thinking about what are those upstream interventions that actually affect people's ability to know what's going on, to access um, information, to access voter, you know, voting sites. You know, Josh and I were talking about uh, this phenomenon where a lot of voter, uh, a lot of polling places are in churches, which are not subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, they do have you know some requirements uh, around access, but if they aren't subject to it the rest of the time, like, are they really going to be up to par? every couple of years in this one day where where they are required to have more access to so like what are these interventions upstream that are not necessarily tied to elections but if we address them maybe that will help in these key moments and it gets back to you know is our elections like a good motivator for things and in one sense yes like timeliness and public awareness uh, can you know get resources thrown at things on the other hand if we only tackle things when there is that public attention and awareness, and we leave off this long tail of like upstream interventions that could actually help in multiple contexts. That's leaving a lot on the table, and also things that might improve a whole lot of other things, like education systems, um, you know, community services, things like that that will increase trust within communities, that will build kind of social ties that are important to get out the vote later on. And so, thinking about it just in the election cycle um, is going to be limited the cyclical kind of nature of, of focus and inattention and attention, that binary, go back and forth. Um, I am curious about how you're thinking there because while this is the first AI election, right, if, if people sometimes characterize it that way, this is the most simple set of AI tools that we will ever see in any future election, right? But the concentration, the focus, the prioritization on this moment will decrease after this election cycle. So from a governance side, you lead the governance lab. I'm curious how you're thinking about trying to maintain push in those areas. Well, I think this election is not only influenced by AI, but it's also going to influence how we govern AI. Lawmakers right now are debating interventions related to elections, related to um, civil rights, related to l thinking longer term about security and, and governance implications of AI. And they don't really know what they're doing. And some of those efforts might not go anywhere. Some of them might get passed, but then they still need to get implemented. And I think you know, whoever kind of comes into uh, into power in you know local, state, national, international contexts will be playing a role in governing this technology, and their political interests are, are going to play a role in that as well. How aggressively are we going to try and protect against these issues if whatever worked this time got got us into power? Um, you know, how much are we going to focus on longer term, you know, future iterations of AI systems that could be really troubling, that could have um, quite a disruptive effect on democracy, but paying too much attention to them can take attention away from the existing issues that AI is already causing to people, communities, in terms of access to economic opportunity, jobs, um, credit, you know, like voice, et cetera. Um, that's a big, you know, tension in the space right now. And so, you know, that's something we're paying attention to, or what are these different proposals and what are the implications of them, both for actually solving the problems they claim to solve, which sometimes they won't. They're, they're just kind of throwing things at, at the wall. Um, or sometimes they'll be quite positive, but people don't quite recognize um, how some of the proposals, even if they don't seem to address the most acute issues, will actually be critical to building a structure where we can govern technology as society, where people can have a voice in how technology is governed, either directly, you know, in conversation with the people building it through co-design, through um, participatory uh, uh, venues, or through, you know, their elected officials and kind of having a voice in that broader context. So it's that, you know, multi-level uh, kind of intersection between the technology and, and governance uh, question that we're thinking about. 
Eli, I mean, Miranda said it, you know, there are areas where this is going to be acute, but acute is community by community, right? And we know the communities in the United States that have been just historically picked on uh, in terms of democratic participation and disparate impact of these technologies and lack of focus around those communities. How should the folks in this room and watching in the kind of tech sector be thinking about maintaining an awareness of how these risks may manifest vastly differently across different communities? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the most, I, th I think the most honest answer to that is a hard one, which is that it, it requires very local expertise. Um, you cannot figure out what the quirks are that cause people to participate or not participate or to have access issues or to have access ease in southern Georgia, unless you're from southern Georgia. That's just, that's just true, or at least working in southern Georgia. Um, and so the, the most hopeful thing I could imagine would be that the tech companies that are really leading at the forefront of these things are doing the unsexy work of reaching out to the most local level people who are administering elections and also just administering like civic structures um, to figure out at that granular level what the potential is for messing things up there. Um, we, you know, we know that like state by state is different. We've accepted that at, at the campaigning level. We understand that talking to Michigan is not the same as talking to Florida. Um, but we do not, we, un unless you get to really super granular political operatives who make their living going from like locale to locale, there's a real lack of appreciation of the distinction between talking to an enclave in Southern Florida versus Central Florida, or talking to someone who is in rural New Mexico versus rural Arizona. Rural New Mexico and rural Arizona are really different. <laughs> They're really super different in the things that motivate them, the things that agitate them. Um, and the best case scenario would be a lot of really granular, close partnerships that are, it's pushing a rock up a hill, um, uh, but it's the way you get the rock to the top of the hill, um, even if it takes a very long time. Um, that would be my hope. It also requires a lot of effort sort of at the middle level, like the state administrative level, to compel those folks at the very local level to engage with the tech companies because I've, I've worked in a in a state and local government um, and for every local and state elected official who is just thrilled to pieces to get outreach from a tech company, there is another one who is rolling their eyes and doesn't have time and doesn't understand and knows they don't understand and doesn't enjoy not understanding things and has just better things to do. Um, so some mid-level incentivization of those very local folks to want tech partnerships that are educational would be very, very, very productive. And that's been an encouragement from civil society for a really long time. And I'm curious, Sam, you, you know, given that that has been what we have been hearing, you need local partnerships, you need to actually listen to the people who are talking to real <laughs> humans. What are the lessons that you think are most important that we kind of carry into this new era? The things that we should have learned, wish we had learned, over the course of social media development in the intersection of elections for the last decade plus. And I suspect I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. I think we, we know these things, and that is part of the problem, right, is we know what the problem is. It's how do we implement it. So uh, I say this with humility to this room as well, that I think how we really make sure we're centering from the start the communities who, and this is to Miranda's point, there's a lot of hypothetical harms in AI and including in generative AI communities that face existing AI harms or the pre-existing harms that AI is exacerbating, gender-based violence, surveillance, mis- and disinformation, exclusion and voter suppression, right? How do we center them? Because the experience of social media is an afterthought um, and the infrastructure was built before. And I think that would be my key point to make is to have AI built in a way that is gonna enable equity requires this pipeline responsibility across the ecosystem. And so in, in my world, there's a lot of emphasis on platform accountability. And I think it's important to look at the outward facing part of platforms like you know Instagram, Threads, X, YouTube, whatever. But in fact, to look at this, we have to look at the whole AI model ecosystem. If we're gonna have things like robust transparency, robust ways to detect that they're accessible to all. So I would say it's the centering of the communities who know the harms because they've experienced them, because they have experience of how to counter them as well. 
And then after that, how do we build this very robust pipeline responsibility? Otherwise, we're just going to be tinkering on the margins. And there's urgency to act this year. Uh, but I would encourage not haste, because I think there's a lot of legislative proposals. There's a lot of attempts to do stuff in the elections context now. But we're laying technical foundations that are going to have implications in far worse years or more complex years or more advanced years around AI in 2025, 2026, let alone the second half of 2024. And if I could just add yeah, that please. even you know, when companies have equity teams, teams like uh, civic technology and you know, elections teams who really get the context and are doing good work, civil society has trouble trusting that that is going to lead to systemic change across the company and and that other teams you know other other priorities won't overwhelm it and so even when they do get to engage like they're skeptical and they'll see any other signal from the company that contradicts those conversations as as undermining you know as sort of a going back on the promise that that conversation had and so that's a real challenge for for I think this room to say how do you actually engage when you're not in control of the organizations that you sit within and you know at, at any moment something could come up that just kind of sweeps aside good work that's been going on, even if that work is going to continue. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky and figuring out how do you localize but also scale is also you know another thing I'm sure everyone's dealing with. Speaking from experience there, you are, Miranda. <laughs> um, as we begin to wrap up kind of this side, I want to go kind of down the row. A lot of the folks here, they're fighting the good fight from within major companies. I'm curious what you each think is the positive vision that if we were looking back five years from now saying, wow, we accomplished this, what should the this have been? In this moment where we're introducing these new tools, they're being picked up by good actors and bad actors alike, what is your hope for the future, and especially the people who are assembled in this room building it? I'll start with you, Eli, because that was just a lot. <laughs> it's a softball. Um, uh, I think my hope would be that there is a real effort to build very, very strong tech literacy into those local communities um, that are um, the centers of, of civic suppression, of, of, of voter disenfranchisement, that there's a real investment in teaching not just a tech literacy, but a tech expertise to the people coming out of those communities, because the, the closer we bring those together, the better we're all going to be. The, the more you remove the middlemen in translation, the better. So like my dream would be that in a couple of years, you've got people who are kids now um, who are you know graduating from the University of Austin or the University of Georgia or like wherever, um, who are who are deeply learned in all of the things and the tools that we are talking about and who are also deeply rooted in their communities, um, who can be those bridges um, because there is an extent to which the tech aspect of this, like the, the, the back end of the AI stuff, and I so appreciate everyone's enthusiasm and thinking that we'll get to like an 85% place, um, it means literally nothing to most people. Um, it's a zero or 100 question for the vast majority of people who are looking at these materials. Um, and the zero or 100 is, to bring back the word, almost entirely based on vibes. Um, and there is nothing more vibe overpowering than a human being who you know. Um, so that would be my hope is to just bring them as close together as possible so you have deeply rooted, trusted expertise in those communities. Sam. Um, I, I spend a lot of time worrying about the negative effects, and I, and I think we should be very worried about the negative impacts here. If we want a vibrant usage and integration of particularly generative AI in, in a number of years' time, you know, we've heard from communities we work with that they see it as a path to access to knowledge, to creativity, to more diverse storytelling, the ability to communicate. Those are all positive visions, but they all depend on the fundamental foundations that are being laid right now around how we design these technologies and where we place the emphasis and who is included there. And so it's just a critical moment right now to place that there if we want to see that vision that is about a vibrant, more enabled communicative economy. Um, but I, I, there are no guarantees towards that, that vision that, that we hear people describing. Randa. I think unlike you know, previous uh, imaginations of technology, there's more there's, and broader awareness that the newest technology is going to have quite a disruptive effect. And for people to be thinking about what those effects are and preparing for it. And so that's, that's positive. 
the challenge is it's moving faster than ever. And so do we have time to actually um, take action on that knowledge um, in, in a way that's meaningful and not just sort of saying, there's gonna be issues in every language. Let's use automated like machine translation to translate our mitigations from English to everything else and like we'll be okay, or like that, that will, will have to be enough. And so I think trying to figure out how to um, bring that awareness of the issues that, that I think even like leadership uh, of these organizations have, they know what could go wrong, to, to get them to turn that into buying some time for, for figuring out some of these issues. And if everyone can kind of work together a little bit, maybe the market pressure to get things out the door, you know, extremely fast will, will go down and everyone will have time to do that. But that's gonna be the, the biggest challenge. Please thank our panelists.